All right, and we back on the forecast. So recently, two Cincinnati police officers, Richard Sullivan and Lawrence Johnson, are under investigation for tasing two brothers, Richard Coleman and James Crawley. Now, let's see what led these officers to end up tasing these two brothers. Sit down. Let me, no, I'm sit not going to sit down. This is my mother's house. Sit down. 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 Sit Stop! Don't grab me, dude. Don't do that, Wait. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. I just said stop, Jenny. Move. Move. I told you. Move. I just told you. Move. No. Move. Stop. Move. Stop. Move. Stop. Move. Stop. You're gonna get chased. You're gonna get chased. Move. Stop. Move. Put your hands behind your back. Now. 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 Are y'all really going? Now. Now. Turn around. Turn around. I know my rights. Turn around. Do it. Okay, y'all Do it. Do it. Turn around. Mama, you gonna let this happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get out of my house. Now, Mama, you now, she is now, get out of my house. now, now, don't reach for nothing. Do it now. Do it now. Now, come over here. Come on over here. No, come over here. Come here. Come here. Come here. You're gonna get tased. Put your hands behind your back. Get out of my house. I told you to get the fuck out of my house. Get out of my house. Get out of my house. Now. Y'all didn't get out of my house. Now. Y'all don't understand the situation. Now. Get out of my house. Get out of my house. We're still fighting with them. Get them up here now. Now. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Get on the ground now. Get on the ground get now. Get on the ground. Okay, listen. Now. Listen. I'm gonna put you on the fucking no, ground. Listen. Y'all not listening. Get the fuck out of the ground. Richard. Richard. Get. Yeah, Richard. Stop. Stop. Oh, stop. Stop. Oh, stop. Richard. Now, get your hands behind your back. Get your hands behind your back. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Get off my hair. Get off my hair. We're not doing nothing. We're not doing nothing. Get off my hair. 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 Give me another fucking hand. hand. Give me another fucking hand. Huh? You wanna fuck around? Huh? 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 Check on Larry. We didn't even do nothing. Y'all wrong, huh? man. Huh? We didn't even do nothing. Why? We didn't even do nothing. We didn't even do nothing. Y'all didn't listen to what we just said. Get out my pockets, man. I ain't got none in my pockets. Oh, you're drunk as hell. I just got done drinking three beers. And you're trying 
gonna buy some crack. Are you serious, mama? Stand up. Are you serious? Uh -uh. You no idea. No idea. You gonna do this to your own son? Shut him up. So the mother of these two brothers, Richard Coleman and James Crawley, called the police. And that's when officers Richard Sullivan and Lawrence Johnson showed up. Now, according to the officer's statement, they were forced to taser them because they didn't comply with their demands and just do what they're told like good Negroes would do. Now, the problem is these two officers never told them they were under arrest. And according to reports, they led them out of the apartment without ever reading them their rights at all. Now, police policy clearly says tasers are only to be deployed against people who actively resist arrest. Now, since they never told these two brothers that they were under arrest at all, they were breaking department policy in the first place. In addition, recently their policy is supposed to be to de-escalate situations, not to make them worse. They are supposed to try to avoid unnecessary force and unnecessary arrest, according to their policy anyway. Now, even though there were former police officers who reviewed the tape and are so-called experts, they said that that force of use did not have to happen and that the police officers clearly did not follow policy. Now, despite evidence that shows these officers clearly broke protocol, clearly violated the policy, they don't face any charges, they don't get disciplined in any way, and instead, they charge the two brothers with resisting arrest. Richard Coleman was charged and pleaded guilty to resisting arrest and got six months probation, and James Crawley pleaded guilty to fourth-degree assault and could face two to eight years, but most likely he'll just end up getting probation. And despite all the broken policies by the police officers, of course the police union had to rush to these officers' defense, which ended up causing beef between City Hall and the police union. And city manager Harry Black getting into it with the police union president Dan Hills. A domestic incident at this apartment in Over the Rhine in August took an explosive turn on a Friday night late last month. He called me at almost midnight. Dan, Dan, please don't me, okay? I know that you are behind it. That's city manager Harry Black talking to the leader of Cincinnati's police union, Dan Hills. Mr. Black, it's, it's, this, is, this is a unique thing, getting called <laughs> late in the evening um, with you uh, more or less threatening me. I'm not threatening you, Dan. Hill shared a recording he made of the call with WLWT. I played a portion of it for Black in his office at City Hall. This recording is just an attempt to attack me. Black says he called Hills because the FOP president wanted the prosecutor's office to delay an independent panel's investigation into use of force by Cincinnati police officers. In the incident at this apartment, police arrested James Crawley and charged him with assaulting an officer. Crawley then made a claim with the city's citizen complaint authority saying he was mistreated by police. I have no problem with a civilian review. Hills and the prosecutor want the complaint authority's investigation halted until the criminal case against Crawley is over. I think everything needs to be handled in a chronological order. A judge agreed and granted a restraining order. That touched a nerve with a city manager. You are orchestrating an obstruction of CCA. If this doesn't change, I am going to personally engage the U.S. Department of Justice. But Hill says he's just looking out for his fellow officers. I believe very much this phone call was made to intimidate. I will turn it over to the feds. Is what I'm, what I'm saying to you. If you want me to do that, then I will. Well, so far, the city manager has not reached out to the Department of Justice to review what he calls obstruction of the police complaint process. For his part, Dan Hills thinks the phone call Harry Black made warrants a criminal charge. Now, even though we know that these police officers broke policy, the police union president, Dan Hills, asked both the city and the internal police investigators to delay interviewing the officers until after the cases with these two brothers were solved. Even then, Dan Hills kept trying to delay the investigation and eventually asked Prosecutor Joe Dieters for a restraining order against the investigators, which he gave him. 
That's what led to the phone call from Harry Black, the city manager, in the first place. He got tired of the police union obstructing the investigation on these police officers. Even though they made it seem like he just called his phone, threatening them, harassing them, all he did was say, if you don't stop obstructing the investigation, I'm going to take this to the Department of Justice. Now, police union president Dan Hills took this as a threat and as intimidation. And he wants charges against the city manager for threatening him. But we have to take this case in chronological order, so we can't get to you until after we investigate these police officers. Now, this isn't the first time the police union went after somebody who dared criticize them. Before, they went after prosecutor Joe Dieters, who granted them the restraining order in this case, just because he questioned the shooting death of the brother Sam Du Bois. A vote of no confidence in Hamilton County Prosecutor Joe Dieters. That's what the Cincinnati Police Union voted last night. The Fraternal Order of Police withdrew support and says Dieter is unfit for his job. Also, the union ordered its president to not renew the collaborative agreement. Not on your side, Kristen Swilly was at the meeting as she joins us live with details. Yeah, good afternoon, Ryan. We just spoke with FOP President Dan Hills just a couple of moments ago. He says this all stems from comments made during the retrial of Ray Tensing, in part suggesting that the former UC officer was not being treated perhaps as fairly or as harshly as, she, as he could have been because he was in law enforcement and was benefiting from a quote unquote good old boy network. People in the FOP certainly took issue with that, and that is what led up to last night's vote. Now, we reached out to several people affected by this, all the different stakeholders. We spoke with uh, with the mayor, with the city manager. We just talked. We just got a statement from the prosecutor a couple of seconds ago. But let's go ahead and get into a little bit of video here so we can give you a little bit of background about what this is all about. Now, again, we just spoke to Hills a couple of minutes ago. He told us about two-thirds of those present at last night's FOP meeting ultimately voted for this decision. Many people were not present and others abstained. He says this doesn't mean he's turning his back or his organization is turning their backs on the community, particularly the African-American community. That question did come up given the uh, original reasoning behind the 2002 agreement. And they don't need to be in the collaborative agreement to affect change, uh, Sergeant Dan Hill said. And we spoke to the city manager, the mayor, and Iris Rowley with the original collaborative agreement. They say they do plan to move forward, but we also spoke again with Dan Hills, and this is what he says was the big reason behind last night's votes. Especially disturbed by Mr. Gerhardstein's baseless accusations that uh, Sergeant Hine conspired with the defense. That's a huge accusation, and it was baseless. There was no evidence of it whatsoever. It's just they didn't they did not like her opinion in that case. Now, our Tom McKee did just speak with Mr. Gerhard Steen, so he'll have that interview coming up in our later newscast. And we have heard back from prosecutor Joe Dieters, who says, of course, he is disappointed, but plans to continue his duties as prosecutor here in Hamilton County to the best of his ability. They were upset with him just for calling them out for justifying the murder of this brother. They have no problem going after anybody who challenges their ability to brutalize black men or black women for that matter, despite if they even admit that the cops violate policies, the cops break the law, it doesn't matter. Every time they shoot and kill somebody, it's justified. Every time they brutalize somebody, it's justified. If they terrorize our children, it's justified. It doesn't matter. Former UC officer Ray Tenzing leaves the courthouse today legally detached from murder charges in the shooting death of Sam DeBose. The judge formally dismissed charges today. All new at five, at least one area police agency says it's willing to take a look at hiring Ray Tenzing. Nine on your side's Tom McKee is live with who's actually interested. Tom, is Tenzing getting back into law enforcement? Well, that's not clear right now, but Butler County Sheriff Richard Jones is opening the door. He says the dismissal of criminal charges against Tensing gives him a shot at becoming a police officer again, even with the pending federal review of possible civil rights violations. He wants to be in law enforcement according to his attorney. Um, 
and he can surely apply at the Butler County Sheriff's Office just like anybody else. Those comments came Monday now that Ray Tensing no longer faces murder and voluntary manslaughter charges for shooting Sam DeBose. They were dismissed by Hamilton County Common Police Judge Leslie Giz at the request of the prosecution. However, she denied Tensing's request for acquittal. I know of him by what I've seen, but I've talked to one of his supervisors um, uh, in the past when this first started and they spoke very highly of him. Defense attorney Stu Matthews agreed. He's a good police officer. Um, he, he did what uh, probably 99% of police officers who were faced with that situation would have done. Matthews pointed out Tensing is well trained and had no disciplinary record as a UC officer. He'd make an excellent officer for any department that wanted to take a chance on us. But Hamilton County Prosecutor Joe Dieter says he doesn't think Tensing should ever be a cop again. I hope not. You know, some of the best people I know are police officers, and I think that this incident was unjustified. Neither does Aubrey DeBose, Sam DeBose's brother. He shouldn't go nowhere and be a cop. I mean, he should take his gun away permanently. Now, there is precedent for this in 2001 and later. Cincinnati police officer Stephen Roach was cleared in the shooting of Timothy Thomas and has served for years as an Evendale police officer. Now, it's not like it's a surprise or anything. They are only able to maintain the position they're in because they stick to the code. They have each other's back. They put aside their differences. They put aside their beliefs against our black ass. And for us to still be surprised and go out on the streets and try to march and protest it, we're wasting our time. We're going to have to change this ourselves. We're going to have to rebuild it from within and protect the things that we do build. At some point, we're going to have to learn that we're all we got. New at 6, a late night phone call and a threat to call federal investigators. Now Cincinnati's police union president tells 9 on your side that he wants the city manager charged with harassment and intimidation. 9 on your side anchor Evan Milward has the recording of that phone call. Yeah, Tanya and Craig, Dan Hills gave us uh, that recording, a 10 minute recording of that call just hours ago. He is now asking for police to charge city manager Harry Black with telephone harassment and threats. The case is in the hands of the county prosecutor. It all comes back to the city's collaborative agreement that pact between police, and the federal government and the citizens of the city and a recent restraining order against the city. Dan, Dan, please don't me, okay? The call at 1140 on a Friday night two weeks ago. Surprise fraternal order of police president Sergeant Dan Hills. This phone call went on for about 10 minutes and it's 10 minutes of basically threatening to throw the police department under the bus, so to speak. Here is more of that call. This doesn't change. I am going to personally engage the U.S. Department of Justice with this department. The, you're going you're gonna to engage the U.S. Department of Justice? On the, ask them to come back on the, because of you. Because of you. He's threatening to go to Department of Justice because he doesn't like the way I advocate for police officers. That to me is disgusting. The disagreement between Black and Hills is connected to what happened in this courtroom days later. A city spokesman tells Nine on your side the city manager was trying to get ahead of this hearing. The prosecutor's office was suing the city, asking for a restraining order against the Citizens Complaint Authority because he wanted officers to testify in a criminal case first. I cannot honestly sit down at the table with a refresh with you all doing what you are doing right now. And I will let the world know this, that you guys are intentionally obstructing the CCA process. The judge would ultimately side with the prosecutor. We're trying to do good, important work here. And if you're not supportive of it, and if you're going to do everything to undermine our efforts in this regard, then I can't do anything. I've got to ask for outside help. Whatever feelings he has about me, that he's willing to then have an effect on the entire agency. And as we were coming on the air this evening, we got this statement from the city manager saying in, in part that he didn't know he was being recorded. He goes on, quote, I was and remain passionate about the topics discussed, especially as it pertains to the importance of maintaining civilian oversight of our police force. You can read the city manager's full response and hear that full 10 minute phone call right now 
on WCPO.com. Video and the incident report we also received, and they conflict with one another on the facts of just what happened on that day. In the report, Tensing says he was dragged prior to the shooting. The video shows he was not. The video does show him grab onto the door of that car after the shooting as the car lunges forward and he falls down to the ground. And the video, as we discovered, shows even more when it's slowed down. Stop. You're looking at really the most dramatic two seconds of the entire interaction between Samuel DuBose and Officer Ray Tenzing. That two seconds changed this traffic stop forever. And we're going to take a closer look at this because the moment by moment, the frame by frame of this two seconds is very telling of what took place. Samuel DuBose here has just started his car back up. And this is Officer Tenzing's arm. You're going to see Officer Tenzing reaches across the steering wheel, presumably to get the keys out of the ignition. At that point, Samuel DuBose reaches up and touches the arm of Officer Tenzing. Then, literally a second later, in this two-second encounter, we see Officer Tenzing's gun in the shot of the body camera here in this video. Then, literally a second later, and we are going to stop it here just before that fatal shot rings out, you are going to be able to see Officer Tenzing reaching in holding on to the seatbelt of Samuel DuBose and DuBose with his hands in the air just before Tensing fires that fatal shot. Developing now a West Suburban police sergeant accused of trying to kill his own son and now we're learning the alleged motive was vodka. Good afternoon, I'm Rob Johnson. And I'm Erica Sargent. Raymond Lauser just appeared in court. CBS 2's Dorothy Tucker was there. She joins us live from the criminal courts building. Dorothy. Well, Erica, according to the charges, Lauser shot his son because he drank his vodka. The 20-year police veteran is now being held without bond. I've known Ray almost all, all my life. Is that right? Yep. What kind of guy? I just thought he was a nice guy. A longtime friend declining to give his name reacts to charges that Sergeant Raymond Lauser shot his own son multiple times. Unbelievable. Don't, don't know what to think. Don't know. The whole story, don't know what's going on. Lauser, a sergeant with the Indian Head Park Police, who once served as interim chief of the department, is charged with attempting to murder his 22 year old son in his Chicago home. In court this afternoon, prosecutors say Lauser called in sick on Monday, stopped by a 7 Eleven, bought vodka, pizza, and popcorn. Around 2 30 that Tuesday morning, they say the son drank three cups of the vodka and replaced it with water. At some point, prosecutors indicated Lauser discovered the exchange, and when his son walked into the kitchen of the house, Lauser grunted, then shot him in the stomach, thigh, and shoulders. Now, the defense attorney tried to paint a picture of self-defense. They said Lauser had a black eye, but prosecutors came back and said that there were no signs of a struggle inside that house. On Monday, Kentucky State Legislator Dan Johnson was accused of sexually assaulting a 17-year-old. Two days later, his body was found on the side of the road. Local officials say Johnson had a gunshot wound to the head and called it an apparent suicide. He drove his car over the bridge, pulled over to the side of the road, stopped, got out, and standing in front of his uh, vehicle from the way the scene looked when I got here. Johnson, a non-denominational preacher, was accused of the 2013 assault in a lengthy public radio report by the Kentucky Center for Investigative Reporting. This allegation concerning uh, this, this lady, this young girl, absolutely has no merit. Johnson said the young woman on a sleepover with his daughter in the church basement had issues with him, but it was not sexual. There's workplace abuse, there's all of that. But at the same time, I think that there's been people that have, have taken that now and just used that for political uh, stones and political rocks. His wife supported him. We are fighters. But Republican lawmakers in Kentucky called on Johnson to resign. He had long been controversial. The NPR report also detailed evidence of racially insensitive Facebook posts, attempted arson, and fabricating his work at Ground Zero after 9-11. In a Facebook message posted just before his death that has since been deleted, Johnson wrote, God knows the truth. Nothing is the way they make it out to be. He attributed his death to PTSD from 9-11, a sickness that will take my life, he wrote. 
I was reading the comments, I saw the sign, and of course I immediately got infuriated because I'm thinking in this day and age, you know, we're still having to deal with things like this. A restaurant here in town facing backlash after a photo of a sign in their building began circulating on social media. If we want to be, you know, remembered as a, a group of people, that's not how we want to be remembered. It's a vintage neon sign from the 1920s restaurant called the Coon Chicken Inn featuring a caricature of an African-American man that Jasmine Abdullah is calling offensive. If you want to put a piece of, you know, American history or African-American history, there are tons of people that you can have hanging up in your in your restaurant, not something derogatory. Abdullah says she reached out to Cook's Garage multiple times, asking them to take it down. But that wasn't the reaction at all. Cook's Garage declined to comment, but posted a public response to the criticism on Facebook. Basically, what they said was that they did not put the sign up to be derogatory, racist, or to offend anyone, that it was a part of Americana history, just like everything else hung in our collection and buildings. It was a piece of history in the 20s. This is not the 1920s. And if they did their history before responding, they would know that that restaurant was closed down before for that particular reason, because of the, the, you know, the racial epitaph that basically stood on. We were not able to confirm if the sign was still up, but Abdullah says it's about more than just the sign. People are always trying to say, you know, racism is dying. It, it's not. And this is just kind of, you know, a reminder that it's not going anywhere. But the fact that it's not going anywhere means that we can't either.